I'm Pamela Pelletier, the community planner here for Team Mock. And tonight is our third docent training session, and we have Brooks Jeffries, who is the director of the Drockman Institute. And I'm going to go ahead and let him tell you all about the Drockman Institute, because he does a better job than I do. But he is also part of the Tumamock Management Council. He is the chair of the Historic Preservation Advisory Committee for the U of A. I always mess that up, so we like to throw a little joke at you. And tonight, Brooks is going to talk about Tumamock as a cultural landscape. And when I first saw this presentation, it really changed how I looked at Tumamock. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks. I hope you enjoy tonight's lecture. Great. Thanks. Welcome, everybody. What, what I'm hoping to do tonight is to fit some of these earlier conversations into a larger framework. And so what I'd like to do tonight is to talk about Tumamak Hill as a cultural landscape. And I'm going to define what a cultural landscape is. So don't, don't get worried that you're listening to a new buzzword that you don't know what it really means. Um, I'm hoping to explain that to you. But really what this is meant to do, and the way that Pamela was referring to it, is it's meant to be an umbrella kind of understanding so that you can kind of fit a lot of these interesting and disparate kinds of pieces, whether it's animal life, uh, plant life, uh, archaeology, which is human, right? It's the human interaction with, with the landscape, as well as some of the other features that we'll talk about tonight. So really, this is an attempt to kind of put this into a, a larger package that you can kind of put your head around, so you can understand the various components. Um, Pamela mentioned that I'm the director of the Drachman Institute, and the Drachman Institute is a, it's the research and outreach, a community outreach arm of the College of Architecture and Landscape Architecture at the University of Arizona. We do a lot of work in the communities and a variety of neighborhoods and do uh, work based on grants that deal with uh, preservation, which is my, my gig. Uh, we also do uh, community neighborhood planning, water conservation, uh, design build, and uh, also work um, with healthy communities, so we work with public health as well. So that's and part of my, my responsibility is really, and my joy is to get out to the community so that we can interact and make sure that we disseminate some of the information that we're learning and doing research on and share it with the community. And that's really what tonight is all about. <clears throat> to give you an understanding of, of tonight's presentation, I'd like to kind of have you understand I'm, I'm like one of those professors that tells you what I'm going to tell you, I tell you, and then I'm going to tell you what I told you, so that you can sort of be repeated and hopefully you'll be able to get it at the end. Um, then we're going to talk about cultural landscapes and as definitions, as a construct or an analytical framework. We're going to talk a little bit about the features of Tumamak Hill, and hopefully there'll be features other than the ones that you've talked about. They'll include the ones you've talked about, but hopefully have a much more comprehensive one. And then finally, this idea of Tumamak Hill as a cultural landscape. <clears throat> First of all, let's try to define what a cultural landscape is. Cultural landscape, as you can imagine from just the two words together, implies landscape, which means about the natural features of a particular landscape, right? Cultural, meaning that dealing with humans and the human interaction with the land. Put those together, and it's really talking about how humans have interacted on the landscape and how, over time, then that landscape has been changed or modified to suit human needs. So the first person who coined this term is uh, Carl Sawyer, uh, one of the famous cultural geographers, uh, back in 1925, where he, he, he talked about it as fashion from the natural landscape by a cultural group. In other words, the, the term I always like to use is a fingerprint. It's the idea that every cultural group has a fingerprint that they put on a landscape. And our ability to then interpret that fingerprint then allows us to understand the meaning and the significance that that particular cultural group had about the landscape. As you'll see tonight, we're going to be talking about cultural groups that uh, exploited the landscape, that they nurtured the landscape, that they used it as symbolic or religious purposes. Each one had its own particular take on the landscape. And so that fingerprint isn't always good, and it's not always bad either. So it's, it's really important to understand that. And so then he talks about the idea that culture is the agent, in other words, that that intervening kind of element onto the natural areas, the medium, and the cultural landscape is the result. Okay, so it's the combination of those two. Further on in, in generation, a guy by the name of J.B. Jackson, again, sort of a pioneer in the field of cultural geography, 
uh, and he was a landscape architect uh, himself. I'm not sure if I'd buy a used car from him, but he, uh, <laughs> he really was sort of one of those luminaries in his field. And he talks about la cultural landscapes as landscape is history made visible. Again, it's that idea of interpreting the landscape and, and what it meant to different people. So the attempt to derive meaning from landscapes possesses an overwhelming virtue. <clears throat> it keeps us constantly alert to the world around us, demanding that we pay attention not to just some of the things around us, but to all of them. The whole visible world and all of its rich, glorious, messy, confusing, ugly, and beautiful complexity. So here's a guy, he rides motorcycles. Okay, he's dead now, but he, he ride, uh, rides motorcycles and he would go around to communities in the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And he wasn't just looking at beautiful pastoral landscapes. No, he was looking at urban landscapes that, was full, that were full of big, huge signs and Las Vegas-like you know, sort of billboards and other kinds of things and saying, you know what, that ugliness still tells us something about the values of that particular cultural group. Right? Whether it's good, bad, or ugly. And so that we can't just separate the ugly and say, well, that's not worth studying, but only focus on the pastoral because it has some aesthetic meaning to it. Is that we can really understand the cultural groups by taking a look at all of the various elements of a landscape and begin to understand those elements as reflecting part of the values of the people who created it. Okay? So he was much more diverse and much more open about taking a look at the cultural landscape, reflecting a whole breadth of different values. Now since then, cultural landscapes have become uh, a phenomenon, and they've been defined by a variety of groups that you're, you're familiar with, and I wanted to share those with you because they begin to synthesize into one particular kind of definition. So the National Park Service, sort of as a steward of, of, our, of the places of importance in the United States, defines it as a geographic area, there's that landscape element again, including both cultural and natural resources, wildlife or animals, associated with a historic event, activity, person, exhibiting cultural or aesthetic values. Pretty broad, right? It's just about everything. UNESCO, United Nations Education, Science, and Cultural Organization, defines it as a distinct geographic area of properties representing the combined work of nature and of man. Human, I would say. Um, the Cultural Landscape Foundation. Cultural landscapes provide a sense of place. Okay, a sense of place. There's one of those terms that we, we see and we use all the time. And identity, the map of our relationship with the land over time. Okay, so in here, in this definition, we're not just talking about a static moment that's a snapshot to say we need to interpret it at one particular time, but rather landscapes evolve the people's relationship with that landscape evolve over time. So we talk about Tuamak Hill, we can't just freeze it in one particular time period and say, oh, okay, let's keep it in that snapshot, because that wouldn't be fair to all of the other cultural groups that came before and then after. So we have to understand that there's a continuum of time that's another part of that element. <clears throat> and finally, the Pima County Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan. This is the roadmap, the blueprint for conservation in Pima County. It's one of the most progressive documents uh, that Pima County and, and this community has really put together. And it's comprehensive about conserving natural resources as well as cultural resources. They define cultural landscapes as a cluster of beliefs. Okay, so they're going back to this idea of, okay, how do people bring value or how do they expose their value to a particular landscape? <clears throat> beliefs, values, and norms about the places and things on earth that are related to human behavior. So here we've got one term, and it's being defined in a number of different ways, but always talking about the relationship of nature, the relationship of humans as that fingerprint on the landscape, and then time as the other element there. Okay? So that's really what we're talking about in terms of cultural landscapes as a definition. <clears throat> well, there is something that goes way off the page there. I want to focus that on this last part here. This is, a, this is a, um, a quote from a recent book, and I put it in there, and obviously I was thinking of just sort of editing it later, but obviously it didn't happen that way. He talks about two different things that we mentioned before. The natural cultural continuum includes past, present, and future, so there's that time element, but also about the fact that 
no matter whenever we're talking about some kind of landscape that we have somehow designated as having meaning, it changes it. Okay? This is a really important concept. Anytime we designate a landscape, we, we ascribe a particular meaning to it. It changes that landscape. And so this idea that whenever we do that, it becomes the politics of preservation. The idea that now we're as a series of competing values and competing groups for the ownership and the stories being told about that landscape. And that we need to suggest that looking at landscapes not as a collection of objects, but as ideas projected on the land, and rarely with a unified voice. This is to Mumon Kill. Okay? The idea that we don't have one voice that really talks about to Mumon Kill, but there are many voices. And so part of the, the purpose of the docents class here, and my purpose, is to try to help you understand all of those different voices that, that has an effect and can really be heard on the landscape if you're open to listening to them. So let's talk about a couple of those different definitions that we talked about before. Sense of place. We use that word, particularly those of us in the field where we're talking about uh, preservation of a sense of place. It really is talking about the connection between the tangible characteristics, those things you can touch, of the environment, natural or built, and the intangible values that give it meaning. So there we're talking about values which you can't touch. You can't touch values, you can't touch meaning or significance. You can touch rocks, you can touch buildings, you can touch vegetation that gives meaning to various groups of people. But these meanings, and you can begin to understand them on a variety of different levels and they represent different value systems that humans have as they relate to that landscape. So those value systems sometimes relate to environmental value systems, cultural value systems, technological, economic, political, and even aesthetic. So oftentimes, again, when we talked about at the beginning, we often look at these things as an aesthetic value. We take a look at a building or a landscape, and we think of it as a beautiful thing. So that's an aesthetic value that we, we take a look at it. It's one lens that we use. But we have to understand that a landscape is composed of a number of different lenses, and that we need to understand these lenses in a variety of different ways. And so that each of those different values has a lens. And, and our goal here with the docents class is to begin to have you understand all those various lenses so that you can begin to interpret the landscape as a holistic composition of all of those different values. You with me so far? Okay, good. Constructs. Okay. Constructs is just a fancy cultural geography term for so frameworks. Okay. Ways in which we can frame our way of thinking about something. So when we talk about constructs, you can also talk about them as lenses. Okay. So if you could just sort of take a minute and kind of sit back and understand that there are people, and we do this all the time, we take a look at landscape, or we took a look at a built environment or a natural environment. We took, take a look at it in a variety of different ways all at once. Okay? Now, what I'm hoping to have you do is to begin to understand it as distinct kinds of elements. So you could use the lens and talk about landscape as nature. And you could take a look at it very descriptively and talk about the features on that landscape, that it's a conical shape, it has a flat top on it, it's made of these kinds of rocks, it's composed of these kinds of elements on it. It can be very objectively described that way. You can talk about landscape as habitat. In other words, what are the communities, human, animal, vegetative communities, that live on that, that landscape? So all of a sudden, we're adding communities. We're adding living beings that are there. <clears throat> you can talk about landscape as systems related to the natural and human systems, how they use various circulation patterns because it relates to the natural features on that landscape. And I love showing this, this image because to a research ecologist who is working on the hill, this is their cognitive map. This is the way that they're looking at the hill. They're looking at it as a series of vegetative plots, research plots, where you're doing your research. So they have, in their mind, they've demarcated where the saguaros are, where the, 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 the agaves are, where the animal communities are. They have a cognitive map that they're able to understand the landscape in a way that divides it up into these various communities. And so again, that's one way of taking a look at that landscape. There are other constructs, such as aesthetics. 
Okay, again, we often take a look at landscape for its aesthetic value. Okay? And sometimes we're offended when that aesthetic value, that lens, is corrupted by something else. Okay? So, for example, we take a look at this as a mountaintop, and automatically my eye goes right to those telescopes, those observatories that are right at the top. I see it as a visual distraction, right? An intrusion on what, what might be considered an aesthetic view of that landscape. You can also talk about it as an artifact. In other words, as an icon, as something that has, it has a meaning as its own shape. And so we can take a look at artifacts the way that um, Ansel Adams takes a look at, at Yosemite. And he photographed it, and those, those beautiful spires of, of mountains. And he created these as icons. And so when we think, of, we think of Yosemite or we think of Yellowstone, we think of the natural features, and they immediately become visual icons for us to remember a place. And they, they have a, it's a touchstone for a meaning. And we can also, the way that J.B. Jackson talked about McDonald's, we can take a look at the Golden Arches or a Nike swoosh, and it immediately it becomes an icon that represents values for some other place. Landscapes have those qualities, and Tumumak Hill does as well. And we can also, related to that, is the idea that landscape also has religious and sacred meaning to many peoples in this, in this, um, in this region. And so we need to understand that for many people, Tumumak Hill is a sacred site. It is a sacred site that is revered and must continue to be revered. And of course, they are offended by any other sort of intrusion on that landscape. So again, this is one cultural group with a lens that takes a look at Tumumak in a very different way. This is an image that's not of Tumumak Hill, but rather in, in Sonora, showing other Trinchetta sites that are, that are connected to each other. And so there's an understanding that the Trinchetta sites, like many other sort of geo-ritual features on the landscape, have a connection to one another on a huge scale that the Native Americans understood as a system of sacred points. And so they, in their cosmology, they have a relationship between these sacred peaks. And again, without understanding that lens, we would not be able to see that and interpret it in a way that was respectful to them. <clears throat> we can also take a look at landscape as well. You know, when I deal with big time developers, they took a look at landscape and they say, what's its potential? What's its highest and best yield, right? And so they're looking at the landscape in a very different lens than I would in terms of taking a look at it from a preservation standpoint. And so what they look at the landscape is the, the highest potential economic yield. They're looking to exploit the landscape for economic purposes, okay? And that's the way that some people take a look at this. We already are seeing evidence of that. There are artifacts on the top of the hill, the antennas, that act as an economic layer, an economic sort of value system that's placed on top of the hill. If, if those folks that, that understood it as an economic value also understood that it had sacred value, they probably would see those as conflicting values. Okay? But they're not seeing them each other that way. And so part of this is to understand that each one of the groups, each one of these stakeholder groups that is part of those shared values, that, that whole group of stakeholders on Tumumak Hill, each one of them takes a look at it in a different lens, or with a different way of looking at it. We can take a look at landscape as history, as understanding the various cultural traditions, the various fingerprints that are on that landscape. We can also talk about it as place. Remember when we talked about sense of place, we talked about designation, and that when we designate something, it's given a new kind of meaning to it, and it has now a political edge to it that understands that we are now having a stewardship responsibility. Once we designate something as either being sacred, as being worthy of preservation, we have a stewardship responsibility, and we take a look at that landscape in a different light. And this is part of the docents program. It's part of the Tumumak Hill Management Council that, that Pamela and I are part of that is working toward trying to understand how do we manage these various stakeholders while still coming up with a set of shared values that is applicable for everyone. And this is a map showing the, uh, on the National Register of Historic Places, which by the way, the Tumumak Hill is designated at the national level, it's a national historic landmark for both its ecology as well as for the significance of the archaeology that's on top of the hill. So this is an incredibly special place. And this is a drawing of some of the archaeology that represents the top of the hill that were done by the fishes. Some of you have seen that kind of lecture. 
All right, let's take a look at some of the features then. Okay, we talked about constructs, or sort of analytical frameworks. Let's take a look at some of the features, again, as just different ways, different ways of taking a look at, at the Tuvuma Kill. We can talk about natural features, geomorphology, geo meaning of the earth, morphology meaning the form, the earth forms. That. We can take a look at it from that point. We can talk about the fact that, that the elevation of this particular hill in the Tucson Valley, in the Tucson Basin, made it a sacred place to the Hohokam, right? It's the same geomorphology, that elevation being the tallest peak in the valley that makes it appropriate for who else? The antennas, <laughs> right? And so you have one feature, one characteristic that is important to both of those, but for different reasons, right? So we can begin to combine those constructs, those, those values, along with the various features, and we can begin to understand how they relate to each other. Obviously, the ecology here can, is, has been defined and has been researched for over 100 years now. We can talk about cultural features. And this goes back to various, uh, you talked about that the, you uh, have been exposed to the two villages that the fishers brought in. So there's, there's a prehistoric period where the cultural features, again, how the humans have interacted with the landscape. They leave behind artifacts. Those artifacts take on a variety of different forms. You've heard about the trincheras. There's rock enclosures, trails, bedrock, milling stations, rock art, agricultural fields. That's part of the human fingerprint. Water control features, canals, okay, check dams, rock alignments. That's part of the trincheras as well. And then roasting pits for agave, because agave was a sacred plant to them. And so there's evidence of all of these things. So for the archaeologist, they're looking for this as evidence, tangible features from which then they can derive meaning about why this place is important and sacred. There's another period here that is the historic period. That is the period um, after the Spanish came and during, in this particular time, it's when the, the Americans began to take a look at the hill, first of all, in an exploitative way. They saw it as a quarry. And so there still is the, the empty gash at the bottom of the hill where a lot of the, the, the stone that created the houses around the University of Arizona, as well as the U of A wall that goes all the way around the campus, some of that came from the quarry at the base of the hill. It was also designated, obviously, and chosen to be the location, the buildings that we're in right now, is the Carnegie Desert Laboratory. And then from then on, there was a whole other sort of set of fingerprints on the landscape from the researchers. Because the Carnegie Desert Laboratory was there to study the ecology. They weren't interested in, in the archaeology. And they were just interested in the ecology. Again, that was the lens through which they were looking at Tupamak Hill. Obviously, later on, archaeological research began to gain significance and to study. And then the observatories in the 1960s, where the, the UA Planetary Sciences came in and began to use Tumamak Hill for the same reason. It was a high peak that they could begin to study the stars. And then finally, the next layer of sort of historical features are the, the, um, the uh, telecommunications towers, which obviously then uh, are already on top of the hill. And again, these are in various parts of the hill. <clears throat> Where we're at in the Carnegie Desert Laboratory is in the middle of the knee of the hill. Uh, where all of these buildings are. The observatories and the archaeology uh, are on the top of the hill. The vegetative plots are in a variety of different places based on what uh, climatological communities they need to be in. So let's talk about designations, because again, each one of these represents then a different sort of way in which people are taking a look at that, uh, at Tumamak Hill, and understanding what its value is and designating that value. So going back as far as 1903, when the, desert, uh, the Carnegie Desert Laboratory was created, it started off as 40 acres and then grew to 884 acres. So this was the large sort of conservation area, really, that was created by the Desert uh, Laboratory. 1940, the US Forest Service established uh, and used this plot, this huge uh, 840, 880 acres as an as a experimental station. The University of Arizona in 1960 took over 500 acres of that plot and then began using it as its, uh, its station for research. 
1964, it was designated, 1965 rather, it was designated as a National Historic Landmark. So this is the national recognition. And when I first read that, I said, oh, it must be for the archaeology. Yeah. It was for the ecology. It was for the fact that this had been designated as a desert laboratory to study the relationship of vegetative communities and its interaction with humans and the city and urban life. And so that's what it continues to be and why vegetative species are being studied here. So this landmark right here was not about the archaeology. It was not about the cultural groups that were here, but rather the vegetative and ecological features. A year later, it was put on the National Register of Historic Places. It was, uh, it was part of an environmental study in 1976. Scientific and Educational Natural Area designation. All of these are just sort of layers of designation then that add more and more, what? Stakeholders, right? To this whole area. A whole other group that's, that's accommodating to it. In 2006, it was uh, designated on the 11 most endangered places on the state of Arizona, primarily because the archaeology on top was not being recognized. They understood that the National Register of Historic Places protected the hill for its ecological features, but not for its archaeological features. And so they designated, particularly because antennas were starting to go in at the top, and they were beginning to destroy the archaeological features that were there. So in 2009, in that, in that time period, uh, the University of Arizona, I was participating in it, the Fishes participated in it, in creating a, an amendment to the National Historic Register nomination to include the archaeological district, which is that area which is on the top of the hill. So finally, we've got the archaeological district that's designated at the same level as the ecological community. And then in 2010, Pima County, um, uh, was able to purchase the 345 acres that was part of, uh, that was owned by the state, and now is joining with the University of Arizona, and we're in the process of developing an intergovernmental agreement between the two agencies for the larger conservation and protection of Tumumak Hill as a unified area. Okay? So finally, we're beginning to understand all of these different stakeholders and working together to help become good stewards of it. Any questions so far? Yeah. Is any of A Mountain included at uh, 345? No, no. A Mountain is, is really part of the city of Tucson's uh, park, and so it's, it's a different designation. So now, where does this new antenna, that new tower, you know, how does, how, where does that fall on this? I will show you. Okay. I'll, I'll see. I think I've got a map that I can, I can point to show it to you. All right, so as we move forward to current times, then these are the list of stakeholders. And you can begin to understand the challenge that we have. <laughs> is that when we take a look at the different lenses, each one of those lenses and even the designations has a stakeholder attached to it. So our challenge is to try to understand all of these stakeholders and what their, what their connection is with Tumumak Hill as a particular place. So we have a variety of different unified tribes that all relate to their ancestry, to this region. So the original Hohokam in their diaspora established themselves as separate tribes that are now federally designated as these tribes. And you've heard all of these different nations uh, around Arizona. They all look at Tumac Hill as a traditional cultural place. In other words, they see it as having sacred meaning. We have it as a desert ecosystem uh, research by the College of Science, as well as the US Geological Survey. Archaeological research being done by the School of Anthropology and the Arizona State Museum, a completely different sort of set of values that are, and, and research that's being done. The U of A Real Estate Administration is the one who leases out the land at the top of the hill. They're the land owner that represents the University of Arizona. They're the ones who strike leases with KULD TV, we've got KUAT Channel 6, we've got you know, uh, uh, cell phone towers, we have uh, law enforcement and emergency towers, we have uh, uh, TV and radio towers that are on top of the hill. Uh, and so each one is cell phone towers. Okay? Each one chooses to move like hill because of its, its point in the valley that allows the best coverage. 
again, the same reason that the Hobocom wanted it, because of the, the sort of area that they were able to look out. As well as, uh, it used to be the US, UA Business Affairs was in charge of actually dispensing the leases, and now that's being turned over to UA Real Estate Administration. We have right of way leases for uh, Tucson Gas and Electric, El Paso Gas. And so if you take a look at, actually you take a look at that aerial photograph and you can begin to see some of the scars on the landscape that represent the trenches and the covering up of the land that represent those pipelines in order to bring gas to this part of uh, the community. And then the other is what you saw coming up, that we have recreation and spirituality. Now many of them are walkers and, and they, they look at the hill as their park. No matter what that sign says, the bottom of the hill that this is not a park. In their mind, it's a park. It's a place where they recreate. It's a place where, and I think it goes beyond recreation. It goes into a, a level of spirituality, that they have a connection to this place that they wouldn't with any other park. But rather, this place is sacred to them, and it, it has great meaning to them. And they use it much more as a place to come and meditate, as well as to recreate. And so I think they look at it in a very special way. Yeah. Um, seeing that the Forester Service had this place for 20 odd years, did they have no stake in it? Not Nor anymore. Nor Fish and Game? Not anymore, no. Fish They're and not, Game. Neither are interested. So no, well, Forest Service is the one actually who established the leases for the antennas. Yes. But they. That helps me. Yep. <laughs> actually, our Homeland Security also has something to do with that? Yes. Yeah, and how that's do they, how do they fit in there? Well, that, they're another of the partners that will be coming on with the uh, in the law enforcement sort of category of, of stakeholders. They're the ones that are coming in and uh, are going to be part of this larger antenna that's going up. So you don't have law enforcement up there. Really? No, not at this point. So it, the list is growing. Yeah. Okay, current owners, and this map is a little bit out of date. So going back to your question about A Mountain, okay, so here is, is City of Tucson then, and, and their ownership of A Mountain. And this was the University of Arizona, everything in red, of course, you know, University of Arizona. And then this was state land that has been, been uh, purchased, um, let's see, part of it is still owned, correct me, Pamela, so part of it is still state owned. And the top L, the upside down L, that's all still Arizona state lands, and then the bottom right table, so this area is part of that intergovernmental agreement that, that I was talking about before. What about the state land? Is it secure at all? I'm not sure, to be honest. My understanding is there are provisions in place that it is only to be used for education and research. Okay. Not to be sold. Isn't that where your uh, Agave is? Yes, those are the Agave fields. But, you know, for me, it's really interesting to take a look at you know, we looked at natural features, and natural features have very organic kind of forms to them, right? <laughs> yes. And we take a look at the way administratively, how we divide up the land, and it's just lines on a map, mm -hmm. you know, that are artificial, um, oh. and, and have nothing to do with the natural features of that land. And yet that's the way land ownership is another layer of how we need to understand how this place works. Not unlike, you know, the U.S. border, uh, international border with another yeah. country. So here are the issues that, that we're facing. As we mentioned before, and this is kind of a summary, that the, um, the issues really are boiled down to this, that there are multiple and often conflicting values among the stakeholders, that there is a need for greater protection of the natural and cultural resources, that we need to understand that there's a marriage between the two, that there's a need for greater awareness for the management of the com common stewardship responsibilities. So the hardest thing that, that Pamela and I do on this on this management council is getting everybody to the table, making sure that everybody's voice is heard and that we understand their value system and what they see to a Machiel as, and then coming up with a common vision and a common stewardship strategy to enable us to move forward with a common voice so that we're able to then be successful in preserving, because we all have a common purpose of preserving to Machiel. And in doing that, one of the things that was created uh, in 2009, I believe, or 2008, is the Tumamak Hill Cultural Resource Policy and Management Plan. And I think Pamela is attempting to get on the blog 
so that um, you'll be able to download it at your at your leisure. But well, we're also going to have copies printed for all of you. So copies might be. Okay. And so, well, this is this is about a hundred and ten page document. Okay. And so, again, this is this was an attempt in two thousand and eight. This was coordinated with that that larger effort to nominate the archaeological area as onto the National Register of Historic Places. It's an area to identify the stakeholders, to represent their common values, and to begin to move forward on a management plan that everyone could, could have a stake in and to, for help us to move forward. So the mission statement from this then, that we all share in common, to protect and preserve the prehistoric and historic resources of Tuamak Hill so that continued ecological research and educational opportunities in this historic setting will be safeguarded for the benefit of future generations. To foster community collaboration and a sense of public investment in the protection and preservation of Tumamak Hill. Okay, can you imagine how arduous it was to just to be able to come up with a, a vision and a mission statement that consolidated all of those different values. But what's really important here is the understanding that it's not going to be a static place. It's not going to be frozen in time. That it's going to continue to have these sort of multiple stakeholders that look at it for educational purposes, research purposes, and you know, dare I say, spiritual purposes. And that we need to understand that all of those values have meaning and have value for the people who, who, um, who claim to them. And that was the attempt to do that. So when you have a chance, you'll take a look at this and you'll see that this is a policy instrument. This is not a, a, a bedtime read where it's a good novel where it's gonna sort of keep you going. This is a policy instrument that allows each of those stakeholders to understand what their role is and how they can move forward uh, together. And identifies then the Tumamak Hill Management Council as a governing agency to help to move that forward. So I've just spent the entire presentation deconstructing that landscape for you. I, I, so we came into this classroom together where we sort of talked about, about Tumamak Hill and I've deconstructed it to give it into sort of different value systems, different features. But I want you to come back to understand that Tumamak Hill is one place and that the way in which people need to look at it is as one place. You can't look at a landscape deconstructed all the time that we would go nuts trying to figure that out. But the idea that you can't itemize all of its parts, but rather it's the idea of a construct of meaning and feeling is that we, we absorb something from the landscape. And yes, we can take time to deconstruct what that really means, but we get something from a landscape in the same way that we get something from a painting, we get something from, from a, of an urban setting. And that uh, part of that is recognizing that that does have value and that that's really what we need to focus on. And that's really all of my presentation and I'd like to open it up for any questions that you might have. Yeah, this is for Pamela and you both. Is that management plan that you struggled over, how long did it take to formulate? A couple of years. And that was 2008 and it's now 2011. So three years have elapsed during which, what? During which time the, the management of the hill shifted from um, no, no primary university unit taking ownership and authority over the hill. So the archaeologists were thinking that the hill was theirs. The scientists were thinking the hill was theirs. And this is sort of in an ownership capacity, an authority mm -hmm. taking, making those decisions. You know, the College of Science, the UA real estate folks, the business office was running the leases. All of them claimed ownership and authority over the hill. Mm -hmm. and, and so obviously there were competing sort of forces mm -hmm. at bay. And so in those years, once we had this blueprint, we were able to take that blueprint to say, we need to consolidate that, put it into one, doesn't matter which one, but give it one authority that allows that to be the clearinghouse for all of those issues to be sorted out. And that was the College of Science. So it's really under Dean Joaquin Ruiz's bailiwick now and control. And he's designated Michael Rosenzweig as the director of the Tomb of Hill. And so, and then underneath the management council, which is the sort of next level of management authority, then we're talking about community outreach programs, research programs. Um, how do we develop um, 
uh, facilities for uh, the public use of, of, of the space. How do we protect and maintain the, the physical structures that are here? How do we protect and conserve the archaeological resources? And so we're now working, in fact, in the last couple of weeks, we've been defining working groups. So we're actually at a point where we were seeing the forest for the trees. We've been working so hard to sort of get this management council to agree and move forward. And now we're at a point where we're now moving forward and we have working groups that are beginning to identify public programs and uh, conservation strategies and research strategies and getting the pro proper sort of policies in place. It's a really very satisfying kind of uh, feeling for me, and I think it is for Pamela too, to see it come to that point. But as you indicate, it takes years. It mm -hmm. takes years. And so, you know, it was created in 2008. I don't think it, it was adopted by the president's cabinet, the U of A president's cabinet, until well, a year later or, you know, 2010, I can't remember. Mm -hmm. And still we're challenged. And so, mm -hmm. you can imagine, um, Homeland Security comes to the University of Arizona and says, Tuamakil is the largest or tallest element in this landscape, we need to put a, a transmitter tower there. And what we're willing to do is you know, work with Pima County, and, and there's a variety of different um, uh, agencies that have antenna communicators, communications towers, uh, uh, relayers and things. We're going to consolidate them. So the idea was we're going to remove five, I believe, different antennas that are currently on the hill consolidate them into one big, huge, tall tower. It's about 125 feet, and the tallest one on the hill now is about 80, I think. So, you know, half again is high, um, and consolidated, removing the footprints of those other buildings that are on the landscape. I'll see if I can pull up um, uh, the, the image I have of the top of the hill, and, and then begin to put that there. Now, it's one thing to be able to plan and say, isn't it great you're consolidating all these things into one tower? It's another thing to talk about, how do the damn trucks get up the hill? We thought, yeah, we went to those and, public meetings. Yeah, and, and how do you do the, just the logistics of being able to, first of all, de deconstruct and demolish the, the other facilities that, that, it's a good thing, we're getting things off the hill, right? Uh -huh. But, you know, then you have a concrete pad. You can't just jackhammer a concrete pad area that could have archaeological features in it. And so this is a very complex kind of thing. It's not your it's not your average sort of property that you can just sort of deal with. There's a lot of different constraints to it. Mm -hmm. 